the worldview, the new paradigm, is the realization that we are these conscious beings interacting with each other, becoming part of the world, contributing to the world, to the evolution of the world. And to, to, to discover this and to develop it, we have to look into spirituality, but you have to look also into science. Peace and riches, blessings. I am Michael B. Beck with the host of Take Back Your Mind. Peace and blessings. I am Michael B. Beckwith. Today, we're going to have a beautiful conversation with Irving Laszlo. I don't know how many books this man has written. We're going to find out when we interview him. He used to be a classical pianist. He's into quantum consciousness, the embracing of the evolution of humanity, and way more. Stay tuned and listen to this man very carefully. He is an international treasure for all of us. Right now, we're going to segue into the life question of the week. Someone wrote a question about their life, and I have the privilege of seeking to answer it. If you have a question, simply email podcast at michaelbeckwith.com, and you may be chosen. Give us your first name and wherever it is that you're hailing from. Blessings. Blessings. Now it's time for our life question of the week. We have a question from Susie C. from Mercer Island, Washington. She says to us, my beloved parents are 90 and 96, and my sweet devoted dog is almost 13. I find myself living in a state of anxiety for their impending passing. I had that experience just a few years ago when my younger brother transitioned due to a rare terminal illness. Essentially, I'm faced with letting go of my entire core family soon. While I have a daily spiritual practice, meditation, prayer, contemplation, service, as well as practices for calming my nervous system, I still have an ongoing low-level current of anticipatory grief. That's an interesting word, anticipatory grief. I know life is good and would like to be able to fully accept what is and free myself from this prison of sorts. But I'm feeling really challenged in having that kind of clarity right now. Can you offer some further perspective around navigating this time? Well, obviously, everyone comes to the planet for their particular duration in order to bring their gifts and talents to earth, and then they, and then they go back into the realm of the, in, the invisible. But you use the word anticipatory grief, which means you are projecting yourself into a future, and you not only are anticipating that future, but you're having anxiety and anxiousness around it, so you're not being present with yourself. In these present moments, since one of your spiritual practices is service. You want to be in service to your mom and dad. You want to love them completely as best as you can while they have a body temple. And when you are loving them and serving them completely while they have a body temple, you're not placing yourself in the future as to when they will exit the body temple because you're being right with them right now. So when it is their time to become invisible, which is an understanding that we're, we are eternal and immortal right now, we don't attain immortality. We're immortal beings now. We step out of a body and we're still alive and we're still ourselves with the ca- capacity to commune with the presence and to do what we're called to do without the body temple. So I, w- I would invite you to not anticipate grief. I would invite you to live fully in this moment of sharing and giving. And then when that time comes, what you will do, and you may even want to do this for your brother, and I actually have a tremendous amount of compassion for you 
uh, experiencing your brothers going into the realm of, of the invisible. But what you begin to do is you begin to think about, you can think about your brother. You can think about your parents when the time comes. And you think about the best qualities that they brought in your perspective. And you say to yourself, in honor of them, I am going to let my life be a living memorial to my parents, to my brother, to my pet, by activating those qualities as best as I can as I walk through the human experience. So you'll, one, not anticipate, ha have an anticipatory grief, you'll be in present. And two, when it does come time for an individual to shuffle off the mortal coil, as it is said, you will live your life as a living memorial for all the gifts and talents and whatever qualities they brought to earth. So that as you, as you go through your grieving process, the grief and the, the missing of them physically will be transmuted by your, your own memory of sacred service and you're calling forth the activity of what they brought to earth as you live it as a living memorial. If you take just a little bit about what I said and add that to your spiritual practice, then you'll move through this process with, with more, can I even say joy? The sweetness of having had the opportunity to be, because you call them sweet parents, having the opportunity to be with them, you'll enter more into a state of gratitude rather than just totally missing them. That's not to say you won't miss them. You probably miss your brother. You'll miss your pet. But more and more and more, you'll live in a state of gratitude for having had the time with them and not wasting the time in preparing yourself and with anxiety about their letting go of the body temple. Susie, I hope this assists you. For all of you tuning in that may be moving through a very similar experience, I hope this Susie's question has helped us all. Have a bright day. I have the privilege this morning of having Irving Laszlo with me. We have been together on numerous occasions on different uh, programs and seminars and podcasts. So it's my, my joy to have him with me this morning on Take Back Your Mind. Most of you may know who this man is, but let me just tell you. He's a philosopher and a system scientist who has published more than 101 books and over 400 articles and research papers. He's the subject of a one-hour PBS special of the life of a modern-day genius. He's the founder and president of the international think tank, the Club of Budapest, and of the prestigious Laszlo Institute of the New Paradigm Research the recipient of, of numerous and various honors and awards, including honorary PhDs from the United States, Canada, Finland, Hungary, the Gill Peace Award, the Assisi Mandir of Peace Prize in 2006, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 and 2005, a member of numerous scientific bodies, including the International Academy of Science and the World Academy of Arts and Science, the International Academy of Philosophy and Science. 2019, he was cited as one of the most 100 most spiritually influential pe people living in the world, according to Watkins Mind Body Spiritual Medicine. In 2020, he was cited as a tw the 28th of the Oom Magazine's Top 100, the world's most inspiring people's list. We can go on and on with Brother Irving, but he's prestigious. And you. I, I don't need that. Thank you so I much. Know. It's wonderful but, to I, be I, I love this man. Listen, give them a little personal story about how you moved from, you know, your, your, your music into this premier uh, scientific individual philosopher that's breaking paradigms every time he writes a new book. Well, I don't know. It wasn't me. It happened to me. First of all, I mean, I was not, I didn't choose to be a musician. I loved it, I appreciated it, but I was born kind of into it. Uh, I was discovered to having talent when I was five years old and I started playing the piano and practicing with my mother, training, 
and playing concerts since I was nine years old and traveling all over the place. So I didn't ask for that. That I, I was born, kind of born into it, and people just assumed that that's what I've been doing all my life. Until I'm in my late teens and early 20s, I started asking questions. And some of these questions uh, I have discussed already as a child, because I didn't understand them very well, is my uncle, who was a philosopher. And, but in my late teens, all of a sudden, I started asking the question, why am I here? What am I doing here? What is being a musician mean in the world? Do, you, do I contribute something meaningful and what? Uh, do I want to spend the rest of my life doing this? And there are questions that you ask uh, that, and then you start looking them up, you know, in uh, attending courses and, and the universities and uh, reading more and more. And then it's difficult to come back. Then I got so involved with these questions and the thinking about that, that I did, couldn't concentrate on my music sufficiently. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't be a professional musician in, in the classical field unless you're doing 100% or 200%. You have to be it, you know, you can't do anything else. And, but I was so taken up with these questions and I started writing, writing notes uh, to myself, really. And these got, as another story still, I mean, it got, it got published like, more or less accidentally. I didn't plan on it, but somebody got hold of it who was who turned out to be an editor of a publishing house. And it was published and I realized all of a sudden that perhaps the question that I'm asking and the answers that I'm coming up to by searching and by listening to music and allowing to my mind to wander, you know, that's a wonderful way of, 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 of coming up with answers, just letting it flow. But maybe though these things are of interest, not only to me personally, but maybe of interest to other people. And then, then I got an invitation from Yale University to come and be a research fellow and spend some time at the, at the university talking to other people about my interests. Then I accepted it and then I had to choose. I had to choose. Either you continue as a musician, a professional musician, which takes up all your time, it has to take up all your time, or you're coming into the academic world and pursue my interest there. And then I had a curious incident and, and at one concert where I was in the middle of playing music and a, a, a famous sonata by Ludwig van Beethoven. And in the middle of it, I realized that I don't know whether I'm playing the beginning or the end, because the same theme recurs at the end <laughs> as it comes to the beginning. I was so taken up with my thought that I didn't know I'm either going to jump the whole piece or going to repeat the entire thing. And not, neither one is a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> so next morning, uh, I sent back a, a telegram to Yale University. This was in Germany, this was at uh, this particular incident. Um, I sent back a telegram to New Haven, to, the, to Yale University saying, I accept, I'm coming. And that was, to their invitation to join them in the philosophy department. And that was really then the step that moved me from being a professional pianist to being an acad academic and music becoming a hobby, whereas previously philosophy was a hobby. So that was a transformation, a shift. Yeah, you became like an, an accidental, like they talk about an accidental tourist, you were like an accidental philosopher, a scientist. But it appears as though as we've looked at your work over all of these years, uh, uh, you had a calling on your soul. You know, you I'm an accidental human being, <laughs> I began to realize. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to live up to being homo sapiens, and it's not an easy task. Absolutely. Now, the, the, the Laszlo Institute of, of New Paradigm Research, what are you up to right now? What uh, First of all, tell people what it is and what you're doing there. and what is your, your latest insight around that? Well, we call paradigm a way of thinking. You could call it a worldview, call it a mindset. You know, it's the way we look at the world, the values that we have, the way we see ourselves and our role in the world. And the, we have come to the, I have come to the conclusion some time ago, and then together with my friends, my family, my bosses, my sons are involved in this, and, and my long-term long friends and, and, and partners, come to the conclusion that if you are going to change in a sustainable way, in a meaningful way, that what has to change is the very basic basis 
of our knowledge of who we are and what the world is, the very basis. We are not what we thought we were, sort of just a human beings with a, with a bone and flesh and blood, blood who would then disappear after a while. I think we are much more than that. And as we look at the new sciences, if you don't want to get your confirmation of your insights from science, the new sciences tell you, yes, indeed, that information is basic in the universe, energy is basic. Matter is not, matter can disappear, but consciousness as such, you know, is fundamental. And we are basically con conscious, conscious people, consciousnesses, if you can say that, such a thing, who are having a, a physical body. So as you know very well, you are one of the most deeply spiritual and famous people in the world on that. And I've come to realize that this calling that I have is a calling to improve my consciousness so that I could contribute something to the world. I think our, my consciousness is linked with yours, with everybody's. Yes. If I, have, if, I, if I come to a higher level of consciousness, maybe I can help others to reach that. Because when we reach that, when we shift the consciousness of this human family, we will be in a better position to cope with our problems. Our problems are due to wrong thinking. We have got to correct the way we think, the way we look at the world, there is a much more meaningful way. Sciences tell you, spirituality tells you, but you have to get deep down into yourself and deep down understand what is the basis of the world. What is this world? I think this world is not a physical world. It's, it's, a, it's a world of what you would call soul or psyche or mm -hmm. consciousness or mind. It has a physical aspect. But what is true, what is basic, is this higher level, a subtle, ineffable level, but is so true because that's what we are. And that's what the world is around us. And we can, on that level, we will not destroy the world, we will not destroy others because we are fine. That's what we do to the world is our consciousness. We do it to ourselves. Our consciousness is interact with the consciousness in the world. Whether it's a single being, a, a transcendent being, or whether it's the immanent in the world. In, I think it's there in every cell, in every quantum in the world, this higher consciousness. But that is what is really basic, and that is the basis for our life. That is our contribution. That should be my contribution to discuss this deeper level. And to come back to your question, the, the worldview, the new paradigm, is the realization that we are these conscious beings interacting with each other, becoming part of the world, contributing to the world, to the evolution of the world. And to, to, to discover this and to develop it, we have to look into spirituality, but you have to look also into science. Yeah. So my institute is, is dedicated to look into a new consciousness from all the points of view. We are cooperating with scientists. We are not cooperating just now with a, with a big university in South Korea or also entirely on this line of creating peace in the world based on a new consciousness. We are just now doing that, that, that agreement with them. But we have many agreements with people around us. We are creating a whole new movement, which we call the Upshift Movement. You know, I can talk about it endlessly, but you tell me what you want me to talk about. Well, I, want, I, want an, uh, I, I appreciate what you're doing there, and I appreciate your breaking down uh, a, a new way of thinking that we have to have on the planet. What would you say at this moment is the most dangerous paradigm that human beings are living in? What, what, what's, uh, what's been uh, holding us back? The old paradigm, the yeah. mainstream paradigm. You know what that is? That is that everything is just matter moving about in space and time. The universe is uncaring, it's passive. It's what we do is what happens and we only do it when we, when we act and the exert force, nothing else is meaningful, and everything disappears after a while. You hear once, do the best you can, and the survival, the fittest survivor, the most strong survives, the most resourceful, the, best, the, most, the, the person who can compete more than anybody else and his competitors. I mean, all these are very dangerous, uh, dangerous beliefs that have created an unsustainable world. You can't, can't live on a, on a finite planet 
in a way as though it would be infinite and it could infinitely provide us and make up for all our mistakes. We have to balance of who we are on the planet with 8 million, 8 million pe people. And this is of 8 billion people. And that is a big job. It's not as we have been doing. We have been taking care of ourselves in the right. short term. Selfishness. We, we become a kind of a, a disease, almost a cancer in the world, just by looking at ourselves and not taking care of how the whole world is developing. So, so when we when you when we look at the world now and we see the polarization, and we see the the rising up of of hate and things of that particular nature, but we also see the rising up of the feminine energy as we notice happening around the world in Iran and Africa. You know, when when we look at all the world of phenomena as it's happening now, you know. What would you say to somebody that's actually happening? How do you how do you view what's going on on the planet right now? We are in a period of reckoning, mm -hmm. taking back, as you say, taking back our mind. That is the key. I, I, I call it would be recovering our consciousness, or recovering our times, our times with nature. We have lost our contact. Our mind goes off as though it will only exist in the world and we can do with the rest of the world as we, what we want. You know, it, 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 some, sometimes science, technology can be the greatest orientation for wisdom, but can it also be the disorientation, the misorientation. Mm -hmm. Just doing the short term, just applying what, what is it for immediate benefit mm -hmm. and allowing that technology to be the master and just we do what it allows us to do so that we can make more money, become more powerful. And that is uh, this imbalance. No other species, as far as we know, on, in this, on this earth, and perhaps in this universe, is actually out there to destroy the rest of it. Right. This is like, like being a cancer. Right. So it, it appears, though, you know, I think that... Uh, <clears throat> You know, when we look at like systems, uh, you know, we look at the system of um, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. We look at certain levels of chaos that then uh, a, another level of order emerges. Sometimes when I look at what's happening on the planet now, we have this intense um, decadence of different structures, the medical system, the educational system, the legal system. There's like a lot of these structures just don't work anymore for the majority of the people. And then we have intense polarization. It seems as though th th there's a there's a, a breakdown happening, and I kind of feel that underneath that breakdown, th there's something trying to something trying to emerge, and and that perhaps <clears throat> the paradigm that you're talking about, the new paradigm, in which we're interconnected, in which we live in this quantum field of oneness, that perhaps there's a birth happening into this next paradigm. And my, my thought is that it's not, it's not going to just happen. It, we have to actually participate in it as, as, as conscious beings. But how do you feel about, about that? That's what I'm working on, Michael. This is just what I'm working on now. I'm just writing a paper, which mm -hmm. I've been writing and rewriting for the past week. I mean, every three times a day, practically. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the question. How do we interact? How do we shift the way of thinking? Of, of, of the human community, at least of some majority of the people in that. I've come across the notion that, first of all, we need a shift. We need what I call an upshift, up, up yeah. to the direction of, of nature. Up means back to nature. It's not back to nature, it's not down, it's up, because mm -hmm. we have lost that. We have, we have to come, we have to retake take back our mind. Yes, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. so, recover our consciousness, reconnect again with the nature and with the cosmos. How can we do that? We can't talk to all the people. Besides, there is no authority in the world, is a personal or, or, or institutional or economic or commercial or whatever, who could, who could legislate and shift a basic change in, in the whole human community. And yet that's what we need. I come, up, I come with the idea now that what we need to act, first of all, on is consciousness. You know, yeah. To act on the worldview, on the paradigm that people have. And next, secondly, just as importantly, 
we don't need to try because it's hopeless to act on everybody's consciousness, to, inter to interact with all people. What we need to do is to create small groups who become the critical mass. Yes. You, know, you know, butterfly effects, you've been talking about it yourself. If, if a small group really develops, evolves its own consciousness, its own paradigm, begins to live like that, think of the, themselves and the world around them as being part of a larger whole. That thinking, that example will spread because right now there is a crisis in the world. There's a disorientation. There's also a search because then beyond the depression and, and, the, and the chaos and the disappointments and the disorient and all the problems with starting with this in the world, beyond that, there is underneath is there is an opening mm -hmm. for something new, for transformation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, the caterpillar, as you say, is beginning to emerge. Right. I think we are living in this period of transition. Very, very exciting because at stake is the future of the human human species. Going right. down, yes, to increasing this increasing disarray in the world, increasing chaos. Climate change is one example, you know, pandemic is another example. Violence and war are other examples. The, 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 the heating up of the atmosphere are examples and so on. Either we continue along these lines where we create this crisis more and more until we cannot get through it without major war and a major catastrophe, or we realize that there are small groups of people who are already evolving a peaceful, mm -hmm. sustainable way of looking at the world. And mm -hmm. what yeah. are they doing? how do they live joining them? You know, the great anthropologist Margaret Mead says, never doubt the power of a small group of people to change the world. I would say this is true, particularly when the world is in chaos. Then it's sensitive to change. Then we have this butterfly effect. Then right. we have what is known in science, the bifurcation, the changing of into different directions. Which way do we go is not determined. We can choose. We are now in a period when we can still choose. We must move up. Otherwise, in the danger of moving down. That's, I think, the lesson. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like the word choice. Um, choice is a function of expanded consciousness, and we have to we have to actually choose to participate in the upshift. That's a, it's one of the names of your books I, I, as well. You know, I want people to read. Um, but we have to actually choose to be a part of that. We can't just linger around. And when you're talking about small groups. Uh, around the world, and and uh, quoting uh, uh, Margaret Mead, that of course, it's the only thing that's really made change in the planet anyway. Small groups coming together and having an idea, uh, a, a vision, uh, beginning to speak from possibility, beginning to act from possibility, and it reminds me of the phrase that you know, uh, high tide lifts all boats. That as you said, you can't go out and change everybody's consciousness, but we can create a high tide. We can the small groups that are growing and evolving, the small groups that are participating in their own unfolding, the small groups that are choosing to upshift, basically are, are, are inundating the field with possibility. And then people are affected. The boats are lifted uh, by the field of, of the seeming small groups. And the other thing about this that I like, and you, you, the fact that you, you talk about science you know, science and mysticism is finally getting married again. Science and spirituality, you know, they divorced back in the Middle Ages, but now they seem to be coming coming back together. Um, and science shows us that a thought that emerges from a field of oneness is way more powerful than a thought that's emerging from a field of separation or worry or anxiousness. So going back to your statement, if we have small groups, that are vibrating at a higher frequency, they're more powerful than big groups that are vibrating at the, at the level of separation. So high tide does lift all boats. And so we're seeking with what you're doing at your institute and all, all these wonderful books that you're putting out and what we're doing at Agape, we're, we're seeking to be conscious, intentional communities that 
inundate the field with with a with a higher vibration, the upper room consciousness, so to speak. You see, and that's, uh, the, hope. that's the hope. That's the way that you are enunciating yourself. Yeah, you know, we can't change everybody's consciousness all at once. We can interact with people who are around us, who are listening, who are somehow thinking along the same lines, and we can we can somehow feel those people. They are, they are coming together. This is a marvelous sense that I have. More and more people are coming onto this new line, this new level. It's a global level. It's a level of interconnection. The big, big lesson that is coming out of the science, of the quantum sciences, is that there's no separation in the world. Yes. Even Einstein, even though he never really accepted or, or, or dealt with it in depth with the quantum paradigm, with the quantum science, he said it very clearly, nevertheless, separation is an illusion, he said. Right. You know, this oneness is there, but as you say, we have got to work on it. We have got to bring it to the surface. We have got to manifest it, act like it. Right. We can be assured that what we do, what you and I do, has an effect. You're already having a tremendous effect, you know, around you. And with those nominations that I've had, I mean, somehow I'll come to the, uh, somehow feel that perhaps what I'm doing has some effect as well. But we are dedicated, I'm dedicated together with my institute and with my sons and, and, and friends that we, we explore that so that it becomes credible. Yes, that science on the, on the upper level tells us these higher frequency radiations, the, the higher ether, the higher aura that we emit, you see. They are interactive. They're creating a new field, a new quantum field, a higher level field, which is a field of, of consciousness emerging on this planet. And it's a, it's a cosmic development. Yes. It's and the danger, of course, is that it breaks down. It won't break down for, permanently, but there can be tremendous nonlinear gaps and hiccups in it. You know, We're living through one of those now. You know. And we have got to have the courage and the vision to move past it and to move back, take back our mind, as you say, go back to who, what we are, one in one with others and with nature on this planet. That is our mission. We can do it. We are science tells us that's real spirituality, deep in, deep intuition that you master and people around you master. Thanks to you, uh, tells us that it's real. We are not separate little in, in, insignificant little beings. We are part of a cosmic drama unfolding, which is evolution, the evolution of life on this planet. It's a yeah. tremendous cosmic event. A absolutely. You, 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 you know, you've been, you've been purveying these ideas for longer than I have. I mean, I've been teaching for 40 years. And one of the things that, that when you were speaking reminded me of the fact that if you go back 40 or 50 years ago, some of the things that we're talking about now was a cult or woo-woo. You know, it was like, it was far out. Now that conversation has become very centralized in our culture. You know, we now, with the advent of science and epigenetics and quantum uh, physics, physics and, and mysticism, that what we're talking about now is creeping into the culture. You know, meditation, life visioning, affirmative prayer, um, a mindfulness, uh, compassion, generosity. Uh, so we can actually see the evolution of the species over the last 40 or 50 years to the things we're talking about now used to be, you know, people used to look at it as strange. And now it's in the conversation. So the work that you've been doing, Irving, over the past many, many, many years, um, it, it has an effect. I mean, people are, are, are coming to an understanding, at least on an intellectual level, and we want to take it past an intellectual level, that we are one, that there's some kind of um, synergistic connection that we all have. And so what we're seeking to do, obviously, because we're the only species that could actually kill them, so we can kill ourselves all at the same time that we create an extinction and we'll take pictures of it along the way, you know, but um, we're actually inviting people to, to, to shift their paradigm, but also to have some level of practice where we have insight 
into this expanding uh, consciousness. So we're not just uh, theorists, we're, we're not just intellectually um, believing it, we're actually practicing it, you see. And so uh, I, I just wanna tell you that, you know, the work that you've done over the years, you have made a difference, you know, and, and, and people are now, uh, their language has changed over the last 30 or 40 years. I mean, we, we have made a difference, but we're at the precipice of a crisis that we have to participate in going the distance of transformation. And, and I would like, and you're one of the tips of the spear of that transformation with your relanguaging and, and changing people's consciousness and, and prolific writing around, around this. But I just want to just point out that when you look at the arc of evolution, we have come quite a distance in the last 30, 40 years. Yeah. Indeed, even, even shorter, in the yeah. shorter, tremendous change. Remember 2012, people talked about the big change that's yeah. coming, the, the famous change, the Mayan calendar and all that, you see. We talked, I talked about these things that we are now talking about as in the future. We are heading in that direction, it will happen, it's bound to happen. And now I have almost the shivers, you know, when we talk about these things because they are happening. Yes. I don't know who brought it them, how come that they came, but they come. We, they, the, the world is catching up with our, with our fantasy, with our, with our consciousness. <laughs> I know, I was just thinking about that. Uh, I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday about the fact that, the, you know, the world has now caught up, at, at least a lot of the world has caught up with what was being taught 20, 30 years ago, 10 years ago. And now there is new insights that I'm having at this time, you know, that I'm, I'm trying to, to, to attain the language around these insights, around unity and oneness. And um, this, this, this is a, there's a lot of stuff, you know, when I, when I think about, for instance, the, the phrase, all things are made new. Behold, I make all things new. And I was thinking about the fact that, or I was actually in a dream. I could see that um, when we're able to hold that higher frequency and sustain it, whether it's sustaining it through yoga or prayer or deep contemplation or study or meditation, you know, we go to another octave and it's not metaphorical. We really are a new being. We, we really are new. All things are really made new. And then we have the possibility of actually affecting other people when we go out because our vibration has shifted. So we're actually touching somebody else. And then if they're able to sustain that frequency and then they touch somebody else and they're able to sustain that frequency, you know, we can say all things are being made new. Everything's vibrating at a higher level, you see. And I would say, don't worry about what you're doing to other people. Other people will feel it, what yes. he's doing, you know. I mean, Gandhi said it very well, be the change, be the change that you want to see in the world. If we are the change ourselves, the change in the world will be coming around, coming about, you know. If you don't have to make people, we don't have to get up and, and offer instructions and, and co make, issue com commands and also we can't do it anyway, but that's not the task. The task is ourselves to change, form the groups, and together we will change the world. That is, I think, the key inside. That's the message. Right. And I think that some of the greatest work that you've done is you actually gave people language and you've actually gave people like a portal into another way of thinking and seeing. You know, you you like um you 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 hit them <clears throat> so that they're actually not just intellectualizing the spirit, they're actually spiritualizing their intellect through through the through your your, your all of your books. I mean, where was your last your last book was Upshift or was there one after that? Uh, the last book is yes, it, it, the Upshift, the path to 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 healing and evolution on planet Earth. Yes, yeah, right. yeah, the path to Upshift. Uh, I've recommended that to my uh, a lot of my practitioners here at Agape to read, so they begin to. Um, just have a, a new way of seeing what their heart already knows, you know, and, gives them and, an, another- and book, let, let me add that that book is not only a, a book on paper. We are now following it up with a movement, the upshift movement, 
And if you, if you or anybody around you looks at uh, absolutemovement.com, you will see, you'll get a website that asks you, give your name and what, what your vision is, write it down. And then we will try to publish that, bring you together with other people and create a movement based on the cooperation of people. We are creating our foundation, the Global Upshift Foundation, and inviting people to come and join us. So it's not just talking. I would like to involve people because we can come together, we can act together, and then we do, we do produce change. We do have an effect. We have the butterflies, we are the butterflies, we are the chrysanthemums, you know, or the chrysalis actually, who is developing into something else. We are in this critical period where things are accelerated. We can acceleratedly running into hell or down to hell or <laughs> coming up into heaven. Both paths are open. No, I like this. Let me let me let me see if I understand it. So you're inviting people to they can go to uh, upshift, the upshift movement. And they can Absolute, load in, they, com, yeah. yeah, they can load in their particular vision, yes, possibility of of, of what what they want to work on or how they see the world or a particular aspect of the world they want to work work on, and then they're connected with people who are having that same vision. Absolutely, yes. And then they come together I, and create a a pocket of synergy to actually do real work in the world in consciousness and in the world to make a difference on the planet. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, you got it, yes, absolutely. You try to make it into a global movement. That's the upshift of the, of the mindset of the consciousness of humanity. I, it's taking it. back the mind of humanity. It's putting us to a higher level, becoming one with each other and with nature. People beginning to feel that, people have now tried to express it. So we can communicate it. We can reinforce each other's awakening. So make it a joint, powerful awakening, a powerful movement where we work together. Not you and I, but always we, not all. Always yes. we together. Yes. It, re it reminds me of uh, a number of years ago, I, one of my books is called The Life Visioning Process. And we developed... Um, a movement that went for about a year in which we called um, tell a vision. That is, you turned off your television and you would meet in small groups and you would tell the vision of your personal life and you would tell the vision of the life of how you wanted to see the world. And these small groups would meditate around it, pray around it, develop an action plan and then, and then walk in that direction. So we said, turn off your television come together in a small group and tell a vision. And, and, and they were doing that once a week for a number of months. And some of the um, programs and some of the, uh, the activities that happened in the world were quite phenomenal, particularly around the young people. Uh, the teenagers and the young people really got behind this. They began to do amazing things, cleanups, cleaning up the beaches and the parks and and uh, developing uh, their entrepreneurial skills to raise money for a different nonprofit. It was, yes, yeah, so I, I, I th th this upshift movement in, uh, is, is necessary for people to, to coalesce around an, a fundamental idea because this is a part of taking back your mind because the mind has been hijacked by survival. And people are just like into surviving and they're nervous and they're fearful and, and they're, you know, but we have to take that mind and begin to put it in a much more creative, resourceful, uh, rejuvenative way. And, and this is what I hear you talking about in terms Absolutely of- Absolutely need that. We need to tell a vision to today. Yeah. And we need it in the future more than ever. Yeah. Because underneath all this chaos and conflict and violence, there is a development. More and more people nations, entire states are coming together, trying to develop common platforms. Sometimes it's in opposition, you know, trying to overcome war, trying to act for in terms of, of the environment or, or the, the resource use or create, creating a new economy. But people are coming together and they're coming together on the global level, actually. And, and the people, the nations of this world are beginning to join together. There is this rift, there's the violence. There is the gap, 
but the, the, the process goes on, pulling people together, be creating flows, flows of information and communication. And you know, where there is a flow of information, then sooner or later, sooner or later, the structure follows. We're creating right. structures for those flows. Right now, they are just up in the internet. Soon we have, we are, we have the United Nations, of course, but we need to have something like the United Peoples. Yes. You, you, the United, uh, uh, United spiritual scientific people, higher level conscious people, because that those people will, will create the world for us. The, the opening is here. I think the message is very clear. We are in an opening section of our history. We yeah. are a transformative section. We can't stay the way we are. Right. It breaks, it's breaking down. Right. But we must find something else. And the else that we are looking for is in cooperation, not in brute forms, forms not in personal uh, wealth and, and power, but in cooperation. This, the one who survives is the most cooperative, not the strongest. Right. We have to cooperate in this world. Otherwise, the world will come apart at the seams as it already has begun to come apart. Right. You, you, one of the things you alluded to there is the fact that there are many people that are having this conversation, but it's not necessarily broadcast on regular media. You know, if, if people just watch just regular media every single day, then uh, they're going to be very pessimistic about the possibility of where we can go. But when we have conversations such as this on your platform, on my platform, on groups all around the world, they can begin to see that there are a, a lot of people, even uh, as you've talked about nations and people coming together to see a better way. A lot of that is happening on the planet, but it's not necessarily being broadcast. People don't, people don't actually know there are millions of people that are actually waking up and going to sleep every single night working on behalf of humanity. And, and uh, but if you just watch the news, you're just thinking about whether you're going to be robbed or whether you're going to be kidnapped or, uh, you know, some bad thing that's going to happen. Um, but in fact, there are actual people on this planet that are seeking to make a mighty difference and inviting, as you just did with the upshift movement, inviting people to come up, come on up into this, into this conversation, into this action. You know, so I always talk about the fact that there's two kinds of reporters. There's the reporters from the old paradigm, and then there are reporters from the new paradigm. That would be us. We're trying to report from the possibilities. And the old paradigm are reporting from what you need to be afraid of. Now, you've been on the planet a, a while, Irving. Are you still optimistic? Cautiously, yes. I think I like to say that I am Possibilistic. 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 Okay, yeah. I like that. <laughs> really, the chance is there. The forecast is not really uh, sound, sound. It's not possible. Too many factors are there. Too many uncertainties have to be resolved. But the opening is there. We have to move. We can go forward. The possibilities are given. And the force, the impetus, is there because it's the impetus for evolution. Evolution, as we now be coming to see in the cosmos and in nature, creating not bits and pieces, it's creating integral wholes. Yes. It's creating living organisms, it's creating planets and stellar, stellar systems and galaxies. Evolution creates, is holistic, it creates wholes, whole, whole oriented, wholeness oriented. If you can go with that, if you can get that, then be going with what young people say, they go with the force, they say, you know, in Star Wars. Yeah. We can go with the force, and the force is this evolutionary trend, which you need to rediscover it. You know, I just say, how do you know that there is such a force? Look at the alternative. If there wasn't, the universe would still be a mass of random swirling inert gases. That's what it was after the, after the Big Bang. But it evolved because interactions are not random interactions. But we have found now in science that the time that elapsed since the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years, years, it would not be enough 
to create the DNA of a, of a, of a fruit fly, a simple DNA, relatively simple DNA, this by, purely by chance interactions among the molecules that make up the DNA. Chance doesn't answer the, how come we are here, you know. There is something more. You can call it divine guidance or inspiration. You can call it intuition. I call it an attractor, an attractor, you know, that creates a tropism, like attraction toward certain kinds of things. The whole universe is building toward higher and higher levels of integration of diverse elements. And that's the force. If you can tap that, it's in us. If you can feel that, then what will all be oriented toward wholeness and we'll feel love when we move that in that direction. And when we move in the opposite direction, we are disgruntled, we are depressed, we feel frustrated. So the force of evolution, the force toward wholeness and oneness is in us and it's expressed in love. Love is not just something that we talk about and something like a whole. Love is there, we wouldn't be living being without living, without loving this, all the cells, love the whole system that we are, without loving us loving what the, what the world is around us. Often it's overlaid by violence, by short-term frustrations, but basically deep down, when we take back our mind, mm -hmm. we reach love. And it's an unconditional universe of love, which, which is a basic feeling. And that's the feeling that is there in every atom in our body. Yes. It's every atom in the universe. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, no, I, I love this. We definitely want people to come to an understanding that back of everything we see, there's, there's, a, there's an, as you said, there's a divine, there's an order, there's an intelligence. Um, consciousness did not come from matter, you know, that there was consciousness. Consciousness precedes form, order, harmony, love, intelligence precedes form. And so with this shift of paradigm that we're working on, we're inviting people back to the beginning of a divine order, a harmony of a let there be life, let there be light, and begin to consciously embrace that, um, particularly at this time when there's a, a, a tremendous crisis of mass extinction. Um, this is a time for a quantum leap in which we go from one level to another without a ladder, but by shifting our awareness. And I dare say that, uh, you know, you've been in the fields working for a long time, uh, uh, assisting with this shift of consciousness and this change of paradigm. And you're so loved and you're so appreciated by so many people on the planet. And I'm, I just uh, so appreciate you and taking the time to be with us today. The ideas that come to me, I try to, to transcribe them. As yes. Well. Put them into words and, and, and write them down if you can. Uh, but they, they come. They, I think the universe is not passive. It's talking to us all the time. Yes. You know that, you know, you can call it a divine spirit. But I think it's there. It's in the whole cosmos that has developed from the Big Bang to this day. And it's continuing to evolve. And it's keep creating more and more connections. Out of the connections will come structure. Will come entities which are be higher level entities at a higher level of vibration we can check that even on the on the level of the brain it emits vibrations it, it emits frequencies you know you see how that the, the frequencies change when you live in a deeper deeply spiritual level you know absolutely this is this is not not imagination it's there the whole the, we can become cosmic antennae antennae or antennas. Yes. Like we yes. can become that because it's we can pick it up. We need to change the frequencies of our of our consciousness. You know, that means shifting, shifting onto a higher level. That I think I can't say that over more over and over again. I need to say that that is the key. Not the not the, not the giving commands, not the uh, ordering or the use of resources or the price of this or the price of that or sending in the Marines. All yeah. those things are emergency, you know, uh, uh, desperate attempts to, to put things right. In us is this tendency toward wholeness, tendency toward cooperation, tendency to work. Yes. You know what I'm thinking about? 
whenever there is like a major catastrophe around the globe, our armed services are temporarily converted to, to, to servants. They go to places, they help people evacuate, they bring in water, they build, a, 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 they bring in a sandbags to prevent um, tsunamis from overflowing uh, cities. Temporarily, they're not soldiers uh, um, creating a space between countries. The countries disappear and people just go in to help. And so the idea is if that can happen on a temporary basis based on a crisis, the question is how can we sustain that way of living in which our soldiers are turned into servants around the globe, <laughs> collaboration and cooperation uh, begins to emerge from immature competition and countries screaming, I'm number one, and countries start to scream, we're one with the one. That's the, that's the evolution you're talking about. And because it's, it has happened and it does happen during crisis, it means it can sustain itself if enough people are what? Coming into the upshift, telling a vision and changing. Yeah, I just, right. I, I just saw it. Right. Exactly. Why do we need defense forces if there are no aggressive forces? Yeah. We only need the defense if there are aggressors. Right. If you're all together trying to keep order and, and happiness and uh, upshifts in the world, we don't need to defend ourselves from anything, you see. Then our armed forces will be permanently on call to keep the world together in a good shape, to help people to live together, you know. That's a role for them. Why do we need destructive weapons? Right. If we put, take away destructive weapons, we don't need any more of that. We don't need defensive weapons if you know aggressive weapons, you know. Right, we have to evolve beyond that. And we don't need that kind of that kind of um, aggressive weaponry, if in fact we're living in a world in which everyone's needs are met, in which yeah, there's okay. a synergetic collaboration between nations, in which all needs are met, which is possible. We, you know, the, the nations yeah. throw away more food. <laughs> you know, there, there is a, there's a kind of a myth which is wrong that human nature is violent, is right. aggressive. If you just let people act according to the nature, they are going to go and, and, and kill and, and exploit and so on, you know. It's the contrary, it's true. Human nature and its basic nature is cooperative because the force of evolution, which created the galaxies, which created the Gaia system on this planet, that force of evolution is toward cooperation, toward oneness, toward integration. Yes. Human nature in its basic sense, in its raw, element existence is a wholeness, wholeness oriented integration oriented uh, integral force and that force is is the as a whole that's what you have to access you have to come to you have to have experiences like that great experiences of nature always is like that the experience of astronauts who looked at the planets from outside you know they changed completely their mindset. They became right. completely different kind of people. Right. Yeah. The Institute of Noetic Sciences was, was founded by Edgar Mitchell, whom I had the yes. privilege of knowing and talking to quite a bit. Um, but he, when he came back, he didn't found uh, some, some, I don't know, some technical facility. He founded an organization dedicated to the evolution of consciousness. You know? Right. That was the key. I'm, I'm a member of that as well. And we've, I've done, um, collaboratory uh, synergetic conferences with them, with the Association of Global New Thought and Noetic Scientists. We've done some things together. So I understand exactly what you're talking about. He, that, that was a great insight that the astronauts had when they saw the world as one and sent us back that picture. It, cha it changed the paradigm. It did. Now we can't all be shot up to space, but we can look at the pictures right. and we can <laughs> enter altered states of consciousness. Right. You know, the great psychiatrist Stanislav Grof uh, showed that you can enter all the states of consciousness by very simple practices, right. meditation, mindfulness. Right. And, and when we enter these states of consciousness, we can communicate with each other. We become open channels, not locked into our skin. Right. So that's, that's, there are so many ways that we can, we can become better human beings. And by better, I mean 
better architects of a, of a world that in which we can all live. That's Absolutely. our challenge and that's our task. That's our mission, I think. Absolutely. I'm going to give you the last word. I just want to just um, let, give a word to the, the individuals that are sponsoring our podcast. Obviously, the primary sponsorship is Agape International Spiritual Center. For those of you who don't know what Agape is, it is an intentional spiritual community that uh, we meet every Sunday. You can go to agapelive.com and actually watch the services. You can go to our university and take classes. You can be a part of over the 30 different ways that individuals can interact with us. Uh, we're one of what uh, Irving is telling us, we're one of those communities that are coming together to create a level of coherence around the idea of oneness with deep spiritual practices. And then the other, um, since I'm really involved in health as well, the other sponsor is Neutralize, Neutralize.com. They help me produce my um, Adapta Zen Super Food Greens. If you go to Neutralize.com and tap as that Adapta Zen, you'll see my products, the Super Food Greens and the Vitamin D3, K2. All of this is good for the body temple that you can carry more energy so that the calling on your soul can be answered so that you can make a mighty difference on the planet. What last words do you have to say to us today, Mr. Laszlo? Well, you are doing, Reverend Michael, you are doing a marvelous job, doing exactly what needs to be done. I'm trying to work along similar lines as well. You're creating a new platform. I'm in the process of also creating a platform of a weekly talk show, half an hour every week for a whole year. It should be called the Upshift Conversations. We will talk once a week for half an hour and then open up for people to comment and to come in on with their own ideas. We hope to run this on PBS or streaming on various internet sites. I think this communication possibilities, these options, the new technologies are a tremendous aid, a boost for creating connection between us, for bringing back our mind into what we truly are, people who are cooperative, who are one, because the information and energy in this world is one, consciousness is one, and we can be a, a brilliant and positive one, a one that has other people to shift up, because we're, our upshift is contagious. It's more yes. than an, an epidemic, it's really, it's the contagion that we need. A yes, new I love it. I use that word contagion in the same way. Uh, what's the best way for people to be in contact with you, Irving? Well, there's the upshift.com and the upshiftmovement.com. Okay. We are creating a new, new uh, foundation, the Global Upshift Foundation. You have its own website. But if you look at everylaslo.com, you also find many of these sites. There's a special yeah. site for, for my books, everylaslobooks.com. So you look up my name, you'll find it. And, uh, and if the, many of them are interactive. I love to hear from people who have with their own ideas because we need to join together. It's not a question of one person predicated or, or, or talking to others. It's a question of jointly coming together, putting our heads, our spirits together so that yes. we can become at a higher level individuals. Beautiful. Thank you, Irving Laszlo, for being with us today on Take Back Your Mind. Thank all of you for giving us, for lending us your ear, your heart, and catching these spiritual ideas that are, that are moving through us. And then going forward, becoming a part of the upshift movement, becoming a part of telling a vision, becoming a conscious part of that which is seeking to evolve through you right here and right now. Peace and radical blessings to you all. God bless. Peace and blessings, and welcome to this moment of meditation that we do on a regular basis here on Take Back Your Mind. You always have a wonderful guest with great conversation, and then we always have a moment of answering a question, and we always have a moment of spiritual practice. What's most important about the work that we're, we're doing 
inspiration and encouragement is about having some level of practice that we do on a daily basis so that we're integrating the knowledge or the information that we are either reading about or taking in classes. We have to have practice for embodiment. So I invite you to uh, turn within in this moment, that is to give yourself permission to come to a complete stop, extract your attention from the world of effects, that is let go from where you have come from, let go where you are going when this particular experience is over, and be right here where your body is, right here where my voice is, right here where your breath is, right here where the beating of your heart is. Come to a complete stop. Let's place our hands in our lap facing upward as a sign of receptivity. As Irving alluded in the conversation about being a part of a great upshift, being a part of a possibility, a greater possibility, as I was speaking about being pulled by a vision, each of us have heard the statement, without vision, the people perish. And you've heard me say over the years that pain pushes until the vision pulls. So you want to stop in this moment and become very still. And give yourself permission in this moment to allow your mind to go wild with joy and enthusiasm about one, great possibilities in your own life, your private life your personal life, your life. This allows for your mind to go crazy, wild, with possibility. Possibilities around abundance. I didn't say materialism or consumerism. Abundance, all needs met. Allow your mind to go crazy around joy, love, celebration, peace, as I say those particular words, just allow the mind to go wild with possibility of you being such a joyful, prosperous, loving, kind being. Let the dynamic of a feeling tone vision emerge in you right now and begin to feel what that feels like. This is the great vibrational upshift around your life. Feel into it and give yourself permission for this feeling tone of your mind going wild about possibility. With every breath that you take, allow it to be magnified more intense, more ecstatic, more blissful. You can feel into your awareness and say to yourself, I'm overjoyed. I'm carrying a feeling of enthusiasm, of harmonizing prosperity and complete love. Let's extend that now. Think about the world, the planet, and begin to extend your awareness so that your mind is going wild about the possibilities on this planet of a sacred communion, sacred cooperation, sacred collaboration. Absolutely, the world is full and wild with love and peace and joy and generosity and the kindness and absolute awareness of our oneness with the ineffable. Don't ask how this is to be done. Just let your mind go wild with it. Personal coherence around joy, love and abundance planetary and worldly coherence around love and peace and beauty and collaboration. Don't ask how, 
feel the what. Now be here for a few seconds of solitude around this expansion of your mind into the sacred vision of possibility. It is from this awareness that we give thanks, that the feeling tone that we are in right now is real, it's reprogramming our very DNA, it's reprogramming our subjective mind, it's reprogramming the brain, so we're not merely living from the life of survival, we're living from the life of thriving with possibility and sacred intention to be more than we ever thought we could possibly be as a species, and as an individual expression of the infinite. Feel into this. I give thanks that this is so. I release this word knowing that it is a law unto itself that only knows its own fulfillment. And I let it be now and forever, and so it is. Now so be it. Amen. You slowly open your eyes, being a fit of gratitude and stay fit with gratitude. Have a bright day. Your time is very valuable, so I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.